Chapter Two of the Phantom Town Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Phantom Town Mystery by Carol Norton. Chapter Two. The Ghost Town. Safely outside the wall of rocks, the four young people drew their restless horses to a standstill. Mary's nettlesome brown pony was hard to quiet until Jerry reached out a strong brown hand and patted its head. Mary lifted startled blue eyes. "'Jerry, what do you make of that?' she asked. "'We couldn't have imagined that gunshot, and surely the horses heard it also.' Jerry's smile was reassuring. "'Twas the story that frightened you girls, I reckon,' he said glancing about and up and down the road as he spoke. It's hunters out after quail or rabbits, more than like. Then seeing that Mary still glanced anxiously back at the gate in the rock wall, Dick said sensibly, "'Of course you girls know that Sven Peterson couldn't be in that high house. He must have been dead for years if he was old when Jerry's father was a boy.' "'Of course,' Dora less inclined to be imaginative, replied. Then to the cowboy she said in her practical, matter-of-fact way, "'Hurry along home to your milking, Jerry, and Dick, don't you bother to come with us. Now that you're working on the Newcomb Ranch, you ought to be there. It's only a few miles up over this sunshiny road to Gleason. We aren't the least bit afraid to ride home alone, are we?' She smiled at her friend. Mary, not wishing to appear foolishly timid, said, in as courageous a voice as she could muster, "'Of course we're not afraid. Good-bye, boys.' We'll see you tomorrow." Turning the heads of their horses up a gently ascending mountain road, the girls cantered away. At a bend Mary glanced back. The boys were sitting just where they had left them. Jerry's sombrero and Dick's cap waved. Then, feeling assured that the girls were all right, the boys went at a gallop down the road and across the desert valley to the Newcomb Ranch, which nestled at the base of the Chiricahua Range. "'They're nice boys, aren't they?' Mary said. I've always wished I had a brother, and I do believe Jerry is going to be just like one." Aloud Dora replied, "'I have noticed that sometimes he calls you little sister.' To herself she thought, "'Oh, Mary, how blind you are!' Dreamily the younger girl was saying, "'That's because we were playmates when we were little so very long ago.' "'Oh, my, how ancient we are!' Dora said teasingly. Please remember that you are only one year younger than I am, and I refuse to be called elderly." Mary smiled faintly, but it was evident that she was still thinking of the past, when she had been a little girl with golden curls that hung to her waist, a wonderfully pretty, wistful little girl. When she spoke, she said, "'It's only natural that Jerry should call me little sister. Our mothers were like sisters when they were girl brides. I've told you how they both came from the East, just as we have. My mother met Dad in Bisbee, where he was a mining engineer, and Jerry's mother taught a little desert school over near the Newcomb Ranch. She didn't teach long, though, for that very first vacation she married Jerry's cowboy father. After that, Mother and Mrs. Newcomb were good friends, naturally, being brides and neighbors." Dora laughed. Twenty-five miles apart wouldn't be called close neighbors in Sunnybrook on the Hudson, where I come from," she said. Mary not heeding the interruption, kept on. When Jerry and I were little, we were playmates. I spent days at the ranch sometimes. Her sweet face was very sad as she ended with, until Mother died when I was eight. Then you came east to boarding school and became like a sister to me, Dora said tenderly. Oh, Mary, when you came west to be with your dear sick dad, I wonder if you knew what it meant to me to be allowed to come with you. I know what it means to me to have you, Dodo, so I expect it means the same to you," was the affectionate reply. For a time the girls cantered along in thoughtful silence. The ruddy road was leading up toward the tableland on which stood the now nearly deserted old mining town of Gleason. Far below them the desert valley stretched many miles southward to the Mexican border. The girls could see a distant blue haze that was the smoke from the Douglas copper smelters. The late afternoon sun lay in floods of silver light on the sandy road ahead of them. It was very still. Not a sound was to be heard. Now and then a rabbit darted past silently. "'How peaceful this hour is on the desert,' Mary began, glancing at her friend, who was riding so close at her side. Noticing that Dora was deep in thought, she asked lightly, "'Won't you say it out loud?' 
"'Why, of course. I was just wondering why Jerry hurried us away so fast from Lucky Loon's rock house.' "'Because he had to do the milking,' Mary replied simply. Dora nodded. "'So he said.' Then she hastened to add, "'Oh, don't think I'm inferring that Jerry told an untruth, but you know that some evenings he has stayed with us for supper, and—' Mary glanced up startled. "'Dora Bellman,' she said, "'do you think maybe there was someone up in that rock house watching us all the time we were there? Someone who fired the gun just as we were leaving to warn us to keep away?' Dora, seeing her friend's pale face, was sorry that she had wondered aloud. "'Of course not,' she said brightly. "'That's impossible.' Then to change the subject, she started another. "'Jerry didn't have time to tell us about the evil eye turquoise, did he?' "'Dora, do you know what I think?' Mary exclaimed as one who had made an important discovery. "'I don't believe he will tell us about that. I acted so like a scare-cat all the time we were there. He won't ever take us there again, and he probably won't tell us the story, either." "'Then I'll find it out some other way,' Dora declared. "'I'm crazy about mysteries, as you know, and if there really is one about that rock-house, I want to try to solve it.' She said no more about it just then, as they had reached the old ghost town of Gleason. They turned up a side street toward mountain peaks that were about a mile away. On their right was the corner general store and post office. A crumbling old adobe building it was, with a rotting wooden porch on which stood a row of armchairs. In the long-ago days, when the town had been teeming with life, picturesque-looking miners and ranchers had sat there tilted back, smoking pipes and swapping yarns. Today the chairs were empty. An old man, shriveled, grey-bearded, unkempt, but with kind grey eyes, deep sunken under shaggy brows, stood in the open door. He smiled out at them in a friendly way, then beckoned with a bony finger. "'I do believe Mr. Harvey has a letter for us,' Dora said. The old man had shuffled into the dark well of his store. A moment later he reappeared with several letters and a newspaper. "'Good!' Dora exclaimed as she rode close to the porch. "'Thanks a lot!' she called brightly up to the old man, who was handing the packet down over the sagging wooden rail. His friendly, toothless smile was directed at the smaller girl. "'Here, tell us how your pa's sitting up again, Miss Mary,' he said. "'Miss Farley, your nursewoman, came down to mail some letters a spell back.' Then before Mary could reply he continued in his shrill, wavering voice, "'That thar pale feller with specks on is her son, ain't he?' "'Yes, Mr. Harvey. Dick is Mrs. Farley's son.' Mary took time, in a friendly way, to satisfy the old man's curiosity. "'Dick has been going to the Arizona State University this winter to be near his mother. She's a widow, and he's her only son. Her husband was a doctor, and they lived back in Boston before he died.' "'Do tell!' The old man wagged his head sympathetically. "'I seen the young feller riding round with Jerry Newcomb.' "'Dick's working on the Newcomb Ranch this summer,' Mary said, as she started to ride on. "'Ho, ho!' the old man cackled. "'Tenderfoot, if ever there wasn't. "'What's Jerry reckoning that young feller can do, bustin' brocks?' Mary smiled in appreciation of the old man's joke. "'No, Jerry won't expect Dick to do that right at first. "'He's official fence-mender just at present.' Dora defended the absent boy. "'Mr. Harvey, you wait until Dick has been on the desert long enough to get a coat of tan. He may surprise you." "'Well, maybe, maybe,' the old storekeeper chuckled to himself as the girls, waving back at him, galloped away up the road in the little dead town. On either side were deserted adobe houses in varying degrees of ruin, some with broken windows and doors, others with sagging roofs and crumbling walls. The only sign of life was in three small adobes where poor Mexican families lived. Broken windows in two of the houses were stuffed with rags. The dooryards were littered with rubbish. Unkempt children played in front of the middle house. The third adobe was neat and well kept. In it lived the Lopez family. Carmelita, the wife and mother, had long been cook for Mary Moore's father. A bright, black-eyed Mexican boy of about ten ran out to the road as the girls approached. "'Come on, Emmanuel,' Mary sang down to him. "'You may put up our horses and earn a dime.' The small boy's white teeth flashed in a delighted grin. 
His brown feet raced so fast that by the time the girls were dismounting before the big square two-storied adobe near the mountains, Emmanuel was there to lead their horses around back. Mary glanced affectionately at the old place with its flower-edged walk, its broad porch and adobe pillars. Here her mother had come as a bride. Here Mary had been born. Eight happy years they had spent together before her mother died. After Mary had been taken east to school, her father had returned, and here he had spent the winters, going back to Sunnybank each summer to be with his little girl. Hurrying up the steps, Mary skipped into a pleasant living-room, where near a wide window that was letting in a flood of light from the setting sun sat her fine-looking father, pale after his long illness, but growing stronger every day. "'Oh, Daddy, dear,' Mary's voice was vibrant with love, "'you've waited up for me, haven't you?' She dropped to her knees beside the invalid chair, and pressed her flushed face to his grey-drawn cheek. Then, glancing up at the nurse who had appeared from her father's bedroom, she asked eagerly, "'May I tell Dad an adventure we've had?' Mrs. Farley, middle-aged, kind-faced, shook her head, smiling down at the girl. "'Not to-night, please. Won't to-morrow do?' Mary sprang up, saying brightly, "'I reckon it will have to.' Then, stooping, she kissed her father as she whispered tenderly, "'Rest well, darling. We're hoping you know all about—' Then, little girl fashion, she clapped her hand on her mouth, mumbling, "'Oh, I almost disobeyed and told our adventure. See you tomorrow, Daddy.'" End of chapter 2 Recording by Bill Borst